like to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. Begin reading in just a moment. In verse 27. There is a series of events that transpired in the time immediately following the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead that remind me of another Bible passage that's completely unrelated, but the accounts are somewhat the same. And that is the report to the apostles that Jesus was risen from the dead. And there is a, there is a similarity at least in form, to those reports, to the report or reports that Job received in Job chapter 1 with regard to the calamities that had befallen him. Of course, the first 12 or 13 verses of Job chapter 1 talk about what a great man Job was and all of the, the flocks, the, the, the herds, the sheep, the camels, the, the donkeys, the servants, you know, all the things that Job had being the wealthiest man uh, in all of the east. It says there was a day when his ten children were at the eldest brother's house and Job was making sacrifice for those for those children. And as he was making that sacrifice, a single servant comes running to Job and says, We were out in the fields with the oxen plowing, and the Sabians came, not the Sabians, the Sabians, the Sabians came and killed all the servants and took all the oxen and I alone am left to tell you. That's verses 12 and 13, I think. 13, 14. Next verse. And while he was still speaking, another servant came and said, We were out with the sheep, and fire fell out of heaven, and killed all the sheep, and killed all your servants, and I alone am, have escaped to tell you. Next verse. And while he was still speaking, another servant comes and says, uh, says of the camels, the Chaldeans came and stole all the camels and killed all the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone am escaped to tell you. Next verse. And while he was still speaking, another servant came and said, your sons and your daughters were in the house of your eldest son today and a great wind came and blew on the corners of that house and the roof collapsed and all of your children are dead. One right after the other while he was yet speaking, while he was yet speaking, while he was yet speaking, while he was yet speaking. But the difference in this account and the account of Jesus was every time somebody came right on the heels of another in the first account, it was bad news. But when Jesus was raised from the dead, it happened like that, and it was good news. In Luke 24, Jesus has been risen from the dead. He's raised from the dead. And he just kind of sidles up beside a couple of fellers walking to Emmaus. And they don't recognize him. And he's listening to them talk, and, 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 and he's asking, what, what are you guys talking about? What's going on? And they're like, man, this, this would be our state. Have you been living under a rock? Are, are, you some kind of, are you some kind of foreigner? Are you just passing through? You don't have any idea about the things that have happened? And then Jesus said, what things? They said, oh, man, this man Jesus of Nazareth came. He was a great man, a prophet, and, and we thought he was going to be the one that, that delivered Israel. But they took him and they killed him. And it's been three days since these things have happened. The Bible says that Jesus began to open up the scriptures to them and preach to them about all the things that Moses and the prophets had to say. And they walked along and they walked along and 
the day was well spent and it came time for them they'd come to their place and Jesus said he was going to keep walking they said no the day is far spent come come and eat with us he went in and he ate with them and as soon as Jesus broke that bread their eyes were open and in the minute their eyes were opened Jesus disappeared and they said, did our hearts not burn within us while we walked and he talked with us in the way? They were several miles away from Jerusalem by this time. And if you don't, if you don't remember, you need to remember, Jerusalem was on top of a mountain. And those guys could not get back to Jerusalem fast enough to bring the news that Jesus was risen from the dead. After walking all that distance, and then in the dark to walk back up the mountain to Jerusalem to deliver the news that Jesus was risen from the dead. But the apostles did not believe. Look in Mark chapter uh, 16. I said we're going to read from Luke, but we're not going to read from Mark instead. In Mark 16, beginning in verse 9, I want you to see how this thing plays out. In Mark 16, beginning in verse 9, Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. And she went and told those who had been with him, that's the disciples, as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. Verse 12. After that, almost like, and as she was still speaking, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country, and they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. In other words, account after account after account, Jesus is risen, Jesus is risen, Jesus is risen. And the 11 men who should have believed it more than anybody else did not believe. And by the way, when you read Luke's account, and especially you read Mark's account, Jesus gave them a pretty good tongue lashing over their hardness of heart and their unbelief. Jesus had been telling these men for some time now, I'm going to die, and after three days, what? I'm going to be raised from the dead. He said it in Matthew 16. He said it in Matthew 17. He said it in Matthew 20, 21. I mean, over and over again. You know, it says Jesus began to tell them. And the, the tense there means he began to tell them and tell them and tell them and tell them and tell them. And then when it actually happened, they still did not, they still did not believe. But we are here because we do believe. We're assembled here today because we do believe. We're assembled around this table because we do believe. We're going to partake of these emblems that represent His body and His blood because we do believe. We do believe that Jesus lived a perfect life. We do believe that Jesus offered Himself up on the cross for our sins. That a spear was thrust into His side opening up Zechariah's uh, fountain for sin uh, uh, and, uh, and uncleanness and we believe that he was in the tomb from Friday to Sunday and we believe that he's risen from the dead and we believe that he's coming again and Paul made mention of that if you recall a week or two ago we talked about 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and the Lord's Supper it says you do this for often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. We're here because we believe. We partake because we believe. And we continue to do so because we believe. With that in mind, if you'll prepare, we'll give thanks for the, for the bread. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the body of Christ as it was made an offering for sin, a spotless lamb of God, uh, without spot, without blemish, 
Father, we're thankful for his willingness to go to the cross and offer himself for our sins. We partake of this bread in remembrance of his body, which was given for us in Jesus' name. thank you for this fruit of the vine. We're thankful for what it represents to us as thy children, the precious blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The blood that was shed to secure our redemption and not ours alone, but for the sins of the whole world. Father, we partake of this, this cup in remembrance of his blood and in thankfulness for it in Jesus' name. Paul spoke to the Corinthians or wrote to them in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. They had made a promise to give to relieve the saints that were back in Judea. And Paul was reminding them of the promise that they had made. And he was exhorting them to keep that promise sooner rather than later. So that the gift that they were giving would be done out of love and not out of selfish obligation, not by compulsion. In other words, don't wait till the last minute to, to keep the promise that you made because if you don't do it now, it's going to be a lot harder to do it at the end. And if you wait until the end, you're not going to do it for the right reason. You're only going to do it because you've obligated yourself to do it. And that's, not the, that's not the right reason to do it. He says in verse number 5, and this is the verse I'm talking about. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be, a, a, may be ready as a matter of generosity and not a grudging obligation. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will reap also bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let's give thanks for our blessings. Father in heaven, we are grateful for so many things that are so abundant in our lives. Father, the, the freedom, the financial prosperity that our, our nation enjoys, Father, we, we realize that we are, are blessed far above any nation on the face of the earth. We pray that as thy people, that our, our thankfulness will manifest itself uh, not only in our lives, but in the things that we return back to thee. Father, remembering uh, the words of David that everything that we have given to you belongs to you from the start. We pray that we'll always give uh, generously with a cheerful heart that uh, you might love the gift uh, that we bring in Jesus' name.